Um, what I wanted to look at is breaking the bondages of darkness. Um, what does that mean? How do we do it to break the bondages of darkness? If we can just start by looking at the first book of John, chapter 1, and starting with uh, verse 5. 1 John, chapter 1, verse 5 through to um, the end of the chapter there. This is the message we have heard from Him, that is Jesus, and we've declared to you, God is light, in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, will purify us from all sin. If we claim that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we, deceive, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word has no place in our lives. Um, what we've got to do first of all is understand the nature of the two kingdoms. There is a kingdom of light, which is God's kingdom because God is light. And there's the kingdom of darkness and uh, Satan himself is called the prince of darkness. And to understand how these two kingdoms function, we've got to consider the nature of light and darkness. And... Uh, to break the bondages of darkness, and obviously in darkness there is bondages, uh, demons dwell in darkness, basically that's what we're talking about here, but God dwells in the light. And uh, when we start to understand this concept, if we can learn how to walk in the light, then obviously when you turn the light on, the darkness flees. Mm. And so if there's demonic bondages, if there's demonic torment um, that's in the place of darkness, the way we can break that is by learning how to walk in the light and live in the light. And um, this is a very foundational part of the gospel. It says, this is the message that you've heard from the beginning. So what I'm sharing here is not an extra part of the gospel. This is in, right in the very foundations of the good news that was preached by Jesus Christ. God himself is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim that we have fellowship with Him, but we walk in darkness, then we're lying. And the first thing we learn about darkness is the opposite of God. The next thing we learn about darkness is that if we're lying or if we're in deception, then we're in darkness. And uh, if we can learn how to walk in the light, then there's a promise of, of fellowship with God. Now it goes on, it says this, if we walk in the light, <clears throat> this is verse 7, it doesn't just say we'll have fellowship with God, it says here, if we walk in the light, <clears throat> as he is in the light, we can have fellowship with one another. We see a whole other dynamic going on here. If we want to have uh, genuine fellowship with one another, if we can learn how to walk in the light, true fellowship breaks out, spiritual fellowship. And a picture of fellowship would be like a triangle, you've got the two people that are trying to relate together in fellowship, and then you've got God at the top. And if we're in unity with God, we're in unity with each other. A spiritual unity. But it is possible to have unity with darkness. So not, not all unity is fellowship. And this is the first thing we've got to understand is, um, if you find somebody that's in unity with darkness, that they're, they're believing and they're propagating the lies of the evil one, um, and we have unity with them, then what's happening is we're aligning ourselves with darkness and we fall out of unity with God. So when we talk about unity in the body of Christ or unity between people, there is actually a limit to unity. There's, there's, a, there's a, a place where you have to say, I cannot have unity with you in this issue. If I want unity with God, I've got to be in disunity with people on certain issues. Do you understand what we're talking about here? And so there's certain people in the church, obviously um, certain denominations want to ordain homosexuals or they are ordaining homosexuals. And if you meet a minister that's fully in favour of ordaining homosexuals, uh, you can't have unity with them. As soon as you fall into a spiritual unity, that's not fellowship. 
Fellowship is, has got to have God involved with it. And so there's a limit. So the other dynamic here is if I can learn how to really walk in the light, there's going to be a breakthrough in my relationship with other people. That's what it's saying here. If we walk in the light as God is in the light, then we can have fellowship with one another. And, and so there's a powerful thing that now happens. It's not just uh, having a, a blessing and a relationship with God himself, but we're going to move into a genuine relationship with one another. And again, it has to do with this whole concept of walking in the light. Not only do we have genuine fellowship with one another, but then we're going to be forgiven from our sins because as we learn how to walk in the light, the blood of Jesus will purify us from all sin. So what's this talking about? <clears throat> Well, Satan, his kingdom is based in lies. And uh, we see right there in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they disobey God, they eat the fruit, and the first thing that happens is their hearts are filled with shame because their, their spiritual unity or their spiritual fellowship with God is broken by sin. And, you know, if, you've got a, if I have this light turned on, I'll put my hand there and another hand here. Because there's this hand between my hand and the light, there's a darkness going on. And the break of the relationship between Adam and Eve and God that was caused by sin caused shame to come into their hearts. Then God comes into the garden and he's crying out, you know, Adam, Eve, where are you? And he's looking for Adam and Eve, seeking fellowship. From God's side, he knows that they've sinned, but he's still seeking fellowship. He's seeking that relationship. But... They hide. That's another thing about darkness. Shame causes us to hide things. The first thing they try to do is they, they get fig leaves and they try to cover up. They're trying to hide. They're trying to cover up. They're, you know, Some people put a mask on to cover up the shameful issues that are there. <clears throat> now, God obviously can see where they're hiding because he sees everything even though they're behind God's got x-ray vision and he sees them hiding behind the bush and uh, he was just kind of like playing a game I do that with my kids sometimes you know they play hide and seek and they're running around all over the house and they're hiding behind the lounge and you can see the top of their heads and they go daddy you bet you can't find us and you know you can see the heads bobbing up and down and I just play the game you know so, where are you you know so God's playing the game but he's calling out to them there's a reason because uh, he knows where they are but spiritually, they're cut off from him. And he's trying to call them back to himself. Um, and when you hide again behind something, and if God's pure light and you're hiding behind something between you and God, you're in the shadow. You're in the darkness. Again, the nature of darkness. Sin cuts us off from God. It places us in a place of darkness. And darkness is where demons dwell. Now, finally... Adam comes out from behind the tree and, and God says, you know, why were you hiding? And he said, well, I heard you in the garden and I was scared. I feared. And so I fled and I hid. And God says, who told you? Yeah. And the thing was, he says, have you eaten the fruit? Now, what's happening here is two things, shame and fear. What causes us to hide in the darkness? Because this is what's happening, um, especially with us men. We find it very hard to come into the light with one another, which means that um, it's going to hinder our genuine fellowship with one another. And we can have a superficial fellowship where we're all wearing our mask and we can pretend that we're doing much better than what we are. And, um, you know, especially Sunday morning, it's very easy to wear a mask. It's very easy to look like we're doing really well and that we're a really great Christian. But um, there's all these other issues that are going on in our lives and there can be shame. I, I don't want to come out and admit that I've got a struggle. I don't want to come out and admit that I've failed. That, um, so there's a shame, there's a fear of being exposed, um, maybe a fear of being rejected. I think definitely Adam and Eve had that. They were hiding because they feared being rejected. Uh, if we continue to read through 1 John, it says that perfect love will cast out fear because fear has to do with judgment. And you see, um, the father didn't really want to judge them. He wanted fellowship. But instead of coming to him and running to him to receive forgiveness, 
They ran away from him and they ended up in a place of shame and guilt and fear. <clears throat> and uh, so men will often hold back because there's all these fears or these shame issues that are going on. But what we've got to understand that um, when we hide something, it's in the darkness. When we keep something hidden, if there's a secret, and sometimes we even lie to ourselves, I'm okay. I'm okay when I'm not really okay. But see, <clears throat> as we read through the first book of John, we'll see that not only is God light, but God is truth. And so if to walk in a lie is to walk in the darkness, when we walk in the truth, the truth will set us free. But we've got to start to come to a place where uh, not only before God are we walking in truth, but before each other. So bring, bring that back in a practical sense. Like you, you probably don't want everyone walking around spilling mm -hmm. their guts all through church either. No. So, you know, how does that work out practically? Good. Very good question. Another thing with uh, like saying, I'm okay, I'm okay. A lot of times I'm telling myself that because I'm not okay, but I want to be okay. Yeah. Mm, you know, if yeah. you're emotionally, <clears throat> spiritually, physically empty, yeah. you don't want to just get around like a sook. Mm. You know? And what good does it, does it do to just say, man, I'm... Good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. There, there is guidelines. Um, obviously not everyone in the body of Christ is trustworthy for you to share your issues. Um, there's certain people out there that will use your issues against you. Um, and I know of cases, there's certain um, leaders even, you know, you go to the leader and you share your struggle and it's just secretly you're going to them because you're wanting to walk in the light. And the thing is, they don't know how to, to walk in the light in grace. And so they expose you. I know cases where that's happened. And, and so my advice would be, uh, generally in relationship, men should be building good relationships with other Christian men. Because the, the more we build a genuine relationship with each other, the more we start to trust one another, and then we're able to start to come out a little bit. And, and I often find in counselling, whether it's a man or a woman, very rarely will the person come out in the first session and share everything. It's almost like they're testing me. They'll come out and they'll share just a little bit to see how I would uh, you know, react or respond to that. And uh, then the next time they come back, they're going to... Because what I'm doing is, if, if, I'm, if I'm faithful, if I'm trustworthy with the little bit of truth that they've given me, then they go, okay, um, I'm not fearing so much that he'll, he'll reject me if I share more. Um, I can trust him. Um, when I, the shameful thing I brought out because he received me in such an open way, um, I don't feel the power of shame so strongly. So there, there's the, the person who's sharing their heart, but there's also the person to whom a heart is being shared. And are we able to start to become trustworthy friends? Are we going to be able to accept people when they share the truth about themselves? Um, and I can tell you as someone that's done a lot of counselling and discipleship with people where people are opening up their lives and literally just spilling their guts on issues, um, there's a lot of stuff in the church, a lot of shameful darkness going on, and it's, it's stopped um, shocking me. Okay, I, um, obviously we don't like darkness, but what I'm saying is I've come to the place where um, people can come and share all sorts of things with me and, um, you know, I don't reject them for it. I'm, I'm aware this stuff is there. Um, I'm also aware in my own journey that I've made mistakes. And so to gain people's trust, often what happens is if I come out of the darkness into the light, I can lead other people out of the darkness into the light. Do you understand that concept? Jesus said the Pharisees are like blind men leading blind men and they're always wearing their mask. Hypocrisy means a mask. They're pretending to be someone and something that they're not. This is who the Pharisees were. This is what dead religion is. And because they're pretending all the time and they're not coming out into the light and being real, therefore they lead other people into that sort of hypocrisy lifestyle. But if, if I can, as a, as a Christian, 
sit down and openly share with other people some of my struggles. And I often will do that from the pulpit. Share about an argument or a fight I had with my wife. You know, I share about what you know she said and I said and then how we forgave each other. But when I'm starting to um, come out into the light, people can trust me. They'll start to come out. And the thing is, it's almost like they think, well, he's not perfect. He's had issues, so I can really trust him now to share my issue with him. Um, what we're talking about now is developing a culture or developing um, an atmosphere amongst us where we're all going to feel safe, create a safe place where we can come into the light and share the reality about what's going on in our lives. Um, for, if someone's always hiding in the darkness, if someone's got their own issues and you share your issue with them, uh, like the Pharisees, they'll usually turn on you with it. So you, you be wise who you share with. Um, obviously, you don't just come to church and just share everything with everyone. Um, but there's times when people do humble themselves and get up from, on the pulpit and they, they just humble themselves before the whole church and they share something. It releases, I believe, something in the spiritual realm. It releases something where the powers of darkness are actually being challenged. Because the powers of darkness rely upon all of us hiding. So this is another thing, you know, obviously you're going to, I'm going to tell everyone so they can't gossip about it, the whole church will know. You know what I'm talking about? Mm. And so you just get up and just share with everybody. And, and the thing is, there's something in the spiritual realm, the powers of darkness are, are really shaken by that. If we can start to come together and start to share our issues... And then the, thing, the other thing that happens too is when someone shares their struggle, suddenly you realise, I thought I was the only one here. Yeah. I, I thought I was the only one with this particular problem in my marriage. I thought everyone else had great marriages in church. And this person starts sharing, you go, oh, hallelujah, I'm not the only one. And then you come out and say, well, I'm actually struggling with that as well. And it actually starts that chain reaction. It's like uh, now those that see are leading others so that they can see. And we're leading each other into the light. So have a wisdom who you share with. Generally start to establish and build accountability relationships with other men. Women are very good at doing this because, you know, sometimes I think they share too much. <laughs> you know, because they, they're emotional. They come out and they're sharing. And um, women will do this naturally. They, they have ladies prayer meetings and all this sort of thing going on. But for us as men, there's a shame thing in our culture, especially Australia, a lot of men don't want to share uh, their struggles. And we're kind of, we're brought up in this, this culture where we just wear that mask and how are you going? I'm going well. I've got, to, I've got to say that I'm going well because otherwise they'll think I'm a wimp. Um, and what I'm not talking about though is you met the pity party people. You met those ones? Yeah. Where it's like, they're always sharing all of their issues and they never like get over it they never get out of it and it's almost like they find their identity and and and, and so that's not what we're talking about here um, when someone shares their issue obviously um, the idea is to bring it out of the darkness into the light so it can be dealt with mm -hmm. and that's what it's even saying here in this scripture because once we have this fellowship with one another then the blood of Jesus his son will purify us from all sin if we confess our sin he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So there's something that when we bring it into the light, then we've got to deal with it. And so when someone comes to you and they share their issue, then it's you, you need to join them and agree with them. Okay, well, what can we do about this? Let's, let's repent before the Lord. Let's confess that this is sin. I'm going to pray for you in this. Uh, I can feel your pain. I can identify. Sometimes you get two people say, actually, I've done that as well. Let's pray for each other. Um, in James chapter 5, James chapter 5, it's very interesting because it um, talks about the prayer of a righteous man availeth much or is powerful and effective. But um, before it says that, it says this. It says, is there anyone that's sick among you? Go and call for the elders. The elders are those that are spiritually mature. Just because someone's old doesn't mean that they're an elder. Do you understand what I'm saying here? And this is one of the keys that we're talking about, what you asked. There's certain people that are spiritually mature. Yeah. If you go to spiritually immature people, 
um, and you start to share all your struggles, they might give you counsel that will lead you further into the darkness. I'll give you an example. It's a bit of an extreme example, but uh, there was this one pastor who in their past had had homosexual tendencies. Um, a boy in the church, I think he's 12 or 13 years old, uh, came to this pastor for counsel because he was having some gender confusion issues. And uh, so he came to the pastor for counsel and input. And um, the pastor ended up having a sexual relationship with him. You understand what's happened? Yeah. Someone's come out of the darkness into the light to deal with an issue. This person had the darkness, and instead of them dealing with the issue in the light, they both went into the darkness together. And then that pastor led him into the darkness. And so there's certain people that can go, oh, you know, I've got this issue, whatever. And then you agree, and well, let's go out and do it together. Yeah. Um, that, that's very dangerous. That's not a fellowship with the spirit. That's a fellowship with the wrong spirit, the spirit of darkness. Um, but, you know, if we can find those that are spiritually mature and build relationships with each other, you know, we don't have to wait for the, the elder elders. We can start to come at a peer group level. As long as we've got that same goal, I'm sharing this because I want to overcome it. Um, I'm struggling with something, for example, with you know the senior pastor. You might be struggling in your mind with, with accusations and different things. And, um, and so you come to someone else to just share this. Now, you can end up all sitting down and, and murmuring and gossiping and backstabbing the senior pastor. Or you can share what the issue is. Give someone the, 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 the safe place where they can share their garbage. We've got, to, we've got to get rid of the garbage. You can't take the garbage out without sharing it. Okay. Give them the safe place. Say, okay, share everything that's on your heart. You know, how, how do you feel about that? Let them share. Let them get it all off their chest. And then say, okay, now biblically, how should we deal with this? In a way that we're going to be able to break the power of all this that's going on in your life. What's the devil trying to do? Always ask yourself in a situation, what's the devil trying to do out of this? And then, you know, you could say, well, I've actually been struggling with some things about the senior pastor as well. Maybe we should pray for each other. And um, maybe, well, maybe we should go and talk to the senior pastor about it. And so bringing in uh, biblical principles, those that are spiritually mature will come back to what are the biblical principles in this? Oh, yeah, well, if you've got something against somebody, go and talk to them about it. And a lot of people won't go to a senior pastor and talk because of fear of judgment. Intimidation. So they can't go, but if you can be a safe place that they can come to you, then you can, can might be able to talk to them and be a peacekeeper, uh, peacemaker, not peacekeeper. Peacekeepers don't work too well. Peacemaker. But see, it says in James 5 that first we, we call the elders and they'll come and they'll anoint us with oil and lay hands and pray for us and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. But then it goes on and it says, and if you've sinned, you'll be healed. Isn't it interesting? Because the whole concept, a lot of, there's a lot of sickness, emotional and even physical sickness in our lives that comes from a sin issue. And when the elders come, they're not just anointing with oil and praying for you for healing. They're sitting down and counselling and they're seeing, is there a sin issue behind this? Is there an issue that needs to be uh, you know, repented of? Is there a person that you need to forgive? Um, and so there's obviously something going on because if you've sinned, you'll be forgiven and you'll be healed. And then it says, therefore confess your sins to one another because the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So how do we become righteous men with the power of the kingdom of God? Through this whole process of coming together, uh, confessing our faults and our sins and our struggles, standing together, that whole concept of locking shields so let's stand together in this. Let's pray for one another in this. And um, I've had a number of times with men's groups where, you know, someone was really struggling in their marriage and they felt the shame in the church to share that. And um, as we were sharing as a group and someone was sharing about their marriage and the struggle they were going through, they asked for prayer. And this other person suddenly was like, oh, hallelujah. Oh, uh, could you guys pray for me too because I've been really struggling with something. So someone coming out of the darkness into the light led him into the light straight away 
And so confessing our sin one before another, this is what it means to walk in the light. Um, definitely when we've got issues against one another, to go to that person and to share, that's the whole concept going on there. We're breaking the lies of darkness because, you know, in the darkness, Satan magnifies things. So you might have an offence uh, against somebody. You might, it might even just be totally a uh, fantasy idea. You think or you feel that they're thinking such. You know what I'm talking about, those situations? I think that they don't like me or they rejected me and they gave me that look or whatever. And so in the darkness, it all builds up and it magnifies because Satan's in the darkness. But as soon as you sit down and you actually talk with that person, it's in the light, it's like, I don't even know why I thought that about them. I feel really stupid for having thought that way. And as we're now talking to one another, it's like instantly all that thing that was built up in the darkness of our minds is just broken. That's the power of walking in the light. So um, that's just basically what I wanted to share this morning. Uh, it's interesting, it says in Scripture, we need to take off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. And this whole concept of learning how to walk in the light, it becomes like a spiritual armour or a spiritual fortress around about us. It gives us a spiritual protection. Uh, light is a protection against darkness. And um, if we as men can learn how to walk in these relationships in such a way, we're going to end up moving in greater authority. Our prayers will have more authority. Our witness will have more authority. Um, whatever the stronghold of darkness the enemy might try to set up in your marriage, it can be broken simply by sharing with the right people in the right way and getting some prayer or encouragement. Whatever the enemy is trying to do in your mind in regards to your children or in your mind in regards to even God himself, when you start to share, bang, we can actually break darkness and put on the armour of light.